nothing. You didn't want people, if you could help it, to experience that, that oh. tunnel, that darkness. When one has a stroke, it is a catastrophic event. Uh, it's a loss uh, in many, many areas of the person's life. Um, so the social worker's primary goal is to help the patient and the family through this, either jointly or individual counseling. Um, we go through the various phases. It's very individual, and that's why social workers are also available, because it's something that's very personal. Well, Colleen helped me get through a lot. You know, I was not in a good place. We, um, she, we, she made me laugh. I loved Colleen. I mean, she'll watch this and she'll see that I just loved Colleen. But no, she helped me get through a lot. You know, they, I was in a really bad place, like really down, really depressed all the time. And I needed her to come in. And when I would have a down day, the nurses would, you know, I always knew the day that I'd be crying in my room, Colleen was going to show up through my door right after that. I always <laughs> knew. Even before I got to Parkland when I was in university, the social worker would always show up right after I was crying when one of the nurses I think initially when it happened, none of us knew the severity of it. You know, it happened, she, she had a 50-50 chance of making it through the surgery initially. So sitting there for that seven hours in the middle of the night was one thing. Once she made it through, we thought, okay, she's going to be in the hospital for a few weeks and, and be home. We had no idea of the time that we had to spend trying to get her well. And I think Colleen kind of kept reassuring that, yeah, she's going to get better. It's, it is coming, and, and that helped, helped us put things into perspective because, honestly, that night when it happened, we had no idea what we were in for, really. When someone has a stroke, it affects the patient as well as the family, and um, part of Social Work's role is to help the families with the grieving process, and it's definitely a grieving process for families. Um, they've lost a loved one's ability to help around the home. Sometimes there's a loss of income. It's just a catastrophic event for them to see someone who was so sudden, who suddenly cannot do what they did before. Um, <clears throat> Never really angry. Uh, a bit of frustration sometimes, thinking, um, yeah. I was know. angry. I'm sure you were angry. I'm I was sure very you angry. Were. Yes, I know. But for us, there's there's not a lot that you could do about it. It was something that had happened, and um, like I said, there's things could have been much much worse. No, they, yeah, there is anger. There's sometimes probably more frustration than anger. Anger is quite uh, strong. But frustration is probably a worst en a worst enemy of it. I know how the people in the early stages of Alzheimer's feel. They know there's something wrong with them. They don't know what it is. I know what, it's, what that's like. I can go to the mall. Then when I come out with a couple of bags, I remember one day I just stood there and I cried. It's so frustrating. I didn't know where I was parked. I didn't know which car I had. I left the keys in the car. Normally I put the keys naturally in my pocket. For some reason, I, I just forgot the keys, so I didn't even know which car it was. I came back, I was off for a month, and I came back to work at the beginning of May, and uh, I was fine at first. It was really great. People were saying, oh, this is a miraculous recovery, and it was sort of on a high. Um, but then uh, depression started to set in, and I had depression with psychosis, which is irrational uh, fears and thoughts. And uh, my neurologist and the psychologist, uh, Dr. Abhijoy de Jude, they both said that um, it was a direct result from my stroke that caused a shift in the brain chemistry that, that caused the depression. Stroke, because it affects the brain, um, affects everything that the brain does. And we're used to thinking about the sensory and the motor things that the brain does, the way that we walk and talk and see and hear. Uh, but the brain does a whole bunch of other things. It's involved in thinking, it's involved in concentrating and remembering and learning. Uh, even mood is organized in the brain. Um, and so when you have a stroke and it affects the brain, you're going to see consequences on all of those things depending on where the stroke is. You know, I was saying to Candace, because the first couple of weeks were pretty good, but after a few weeks, um, it was just not right. She was she was not right, and it wasn't doesn't present as sadness mm -hmm. at all. It presented as anxiety, much more anxious than, yeah. than sad. But it became very very difficult to 
uh, you know, Canada should be very concerned about one thing, and and I would try and reassure on that one item, but clearly, it was so clear to me that that, that wasn't what we were talking about, or that that wasn't what was really going on. Well, there's a big difference between uh, crying and a clinically significant disorder of mood. Um, crying is a normal thing. Being depressed, being angry, being irritable, those are all important emotions. The reason our brain does them is because they're flags. They tell us there's danger here, there's something that's not right here, and those are important flags. You know, the notion of, I don't ever want to be depressed or angry again, it doesn't really make good biological sense. Those are emotions that make sense. Once they get out of hand and they st start to take on a life of their own, then it's a problem. This strut was, um, that was fairly easy in the sense that it was a physical situation that uh, Candace got over, you know, very, very quickly. Uh, the depression, oh, that was the tough one. That was a lot worse than the stroke. Uh, at one point, I was so desperate, I just called her, uh, her, her uh, GP, or a doctor, and um, mentioned the situation. They said, well, this woman, like, she's, she's going crazy or something. This was not Candace. This was, not, this was Candace's body, but this is a different, different person altogether. But if it start to t starts to take on a life of its own, where it's not related anymore to what's going on in your world, where it's persistent and uh, it starts to be associated with a loss of interest that's persistent, where it starts to affect your appetite and it starts to affect your sleep and it starts to affect how you think about yourself. It starts to affect whether or not you wish to go on living. Once it starts to take on that kind of flavor, that's not grief, that's something else and it needs clinical attention. If you see signs of that, just go and see a psychiatrist right away. Get help right away because there's no need to suffer for a long time. They know what to do. I may also say that as far as depression is concerned, if they could fix the stroke, well, I'm sure they could fix the depression. So she'll be back eventually. People really need to think that this is a treatable issue, that there are things that we can do and not let the depression um, speak for them and let that because I've seen people say, well, there's no point getting treated because nothing's going to work. That's the depression talking. The friends I had prior to my stroke, the, uh, and I haven't ever actually voiced this m much more than, than Doug and I, a lot of them didn't know how to deal with what happened to me. Um, I know my friend, one of my best friends, who who had just since a year ago passed away with cervical cancer, and she was closer to me than my sister. She told me when she came into the hospital and saw me laying flat in the bed with the bars up, and I couldn't even sit up. She just wept for a week, and she didn't know how she'd be able to deal with the fact that I might not ever walk again. <clears throat> and they did find it hard. I think the people that have just accepted me as me are the people I've met since my stroke. But for sure, friends are a really integral part, part of my life. I ended up being in um, almost a semi-retirement state when I didn't go back to work. <clears throat> I was 45 years old and all my friends were out working still. A, a group of, of retired people picked me up and <laughs> ended up taking me to their Probus Club, which is professional business retirees, and they took me on their side trips and for lunch and for coffee, and we started a craft group Monday night that gets together, and they've really been an integral part of, of really, really my um, developing a really wonderful lifestyle. My friends before my stroke are still wonderfully in my life, um, maybe on a little different level. The people the immediate people that did know, um, when they would come to the house for a visit, you could see the look in their eye of just total devastation, uh, pity, not knowing, you know, where I was going to go and and how well I was going to come through it. Um, that's hard. I think people do treat you different once they find out. Um, I was lucky enough that a lot of people, um, <clears throat> if they don't know, they would probably never know that I had something as serious as I did. Um, 
I, I think, yeah, people, I think, do treat you differently, and it's uh, apparently, I guess it would be hard not to, but still, um, if, if we tried to treat ev everyone as normally as we could, I think it would help the people that are facing, which I know it depends on the severity of, of what it is, but um, uh, the more normal you can be treated, I think uh, the easier it is on you. I think one of the, the biggest hurdles for me was for two years I was trying to find a way to make my life count for something. Uh, I wasn't ready to be put on a shelf or kicked under the bed like an old shoe. I still felt there had to be some reason why, or or I think pain comes into people's lives and, and you can either um, be a victim of it or you can become a student of it. And I wanted to be a student. Well, Steve's writing down about Teresa, his daughter, and uh, she did a documentary in 1999. Oh, good. Um, for Out Front. It was an 11 or 12 minute piece that uh, um, oh. it's called Talking Through Aphasia. Oh yes. She gave a perspective as an adult child's view and uh, I still remember sitting listening oh. to this on the radio. Come on, there. Are <laughs> you crying? Yes. Come on. Sure. Thank you. Okay. He had a purpose oh. because... Let's go. Well, you and Carolyn, yeah. Steve's younger daughter, um, went and got permission from CBC to copy that yes. onto tapes. Uh, my daughter is a graphic designer, and uh, they work together on the cover for the tape. Oh. So... We had a thousand made. Oh, yes. And I joke with him because I say he was then armed and dangerous. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. I've always, as they say, I've always had this, you know, this good outlook. Um, but um, I don't think it, uh, how can I put this? For When it first happens, or when it happened, I felt like, yes, I am going backwards instead of forwards, but eventually each little thing I could do for myself, uh, and even every other day I could see that I was moving forward, and that made me feel better. Here's what happens sometimes. People come to the door and I'll say, can I help you? I don't even know who they are. Well, it's personal. Well, come on in, they sit down, what is it? And they start crying, we got a mother, a father. I've been through them all, a mother, a father, brother, sister, aunt, uncle, niece, nephew, son, daughter, who's, who's had a stroke, they're in a the hospital. They can't move, they can't talk, they can't walk. Can you come with us to the hospital? Let them see you. You be an inspiration to them. Maybe they'll be like you. Please, can you come? They start crying. I've never ever said no, but when, when I do go, I'll say to that individual who's laying there who's partially paralyzed or who can't talk but knows what's going on, I'll say, you know what? I was just like you, just like you. I never walked for, for uh, months and months. I was in Oslo for 10 months. I didn't know who my family were. I wasn't even supposed to live the night. Physically, you're okay. Everything's going to be fine with you that particular way. <clears throat> and I said, only you can make yourself better. You have to want to get better. Everybody else is going to help you. You don't have to worry about that. We're lucky. We live in the best country in the world. We have the best medication, everything in the people. But it's, it's up to you. If you want to get better, you can get better. Look at me, I'll, and then I'll go like this. I'll move my hands around. I wasn't supposed to live the night, and here I am telling you. That was 1991. That's 15 years ago. Here I am. I'm fine.